Welcome to the No Unfinished Business Podcast. There are a thousand different ways your clients can leave unfinished business, but no single advisor can address every issue. In every episode, we'll answer the important questions to help professional advisors focused on individual clients, attorneys, CPAs, and financial advisors, identify and eliminate those planning blind spots so you can speak competently and confidently to your clients and help them leave no unfinished business. Hey, Griffin, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, John. So as we were talking before we got started recording, the topic we've come up with for today is what to do after the ink dries. The issue is that a lot of clients think, oh my gosh, I have signed these documents. I've reached the finish line. I can put them away, confident knowing that whatever needs to be done has been done. The reality is it's not that you have a lot of work left, but there is still some work that needs to be done once you sign those documents. So where do we even start on this? Okay, well, there's a variety of ways to start. And I always find it's good to kind of... Okay. Good place to start is always to think of the big picture of what's in your head. What helps you to live your day-to-day life that somebody would need access to in order to step into your shoes if something were to happen to you. And it's not even if you're deceased, it could be if you're hospitalized, incapacitated, whatever the case might be. And I often liken it to, okay, you've built up this beautiful Ferrari and you're gonna leave it to your family members, but where are the keys? Where's the owner's manual? Where's the map? Do you have money for gas that's immediately accessible? So as long as you keep that theme in mind, that kind of leads you uh, by um, allegory towards what you need to know. So a lot of people think about the funding of the estate plan, which is obviously important. And there's a lot of state by state nuances to it. But I think it helps to think of the fact that you have potentially several different wills, quote unquote, floating out there. Every time you do a beneficiary designation for say a life insurance policy or retirement account, and now increasingly brokerage accounts push what they call a a pay on death or transfer on death designation, which is really in operation the same as a beneficiary designation. So over the years, you can accumulate tons of those. And what few people realize is it doesn't matter what you spend on your estate planning documents or how comprehensive they are. If you have beneficiary designations that don't either name your estate as the beneficiary, which is a bad outcome in a lot of circumstances, or the beneficiary designations don't name a specific trust that you've put in place, which may sometimes also be a bad outcome as well, uh, then all these beneficiary designations are going to override the terms of your estate plan. So I think the biggest I guess lowest hanging fruit there is out there is looking at all of these and saying, hey, how can we make these beneficiary designations work in our favor? And you could even see this in some states for real estate parcels. Some states will allow you to do a beneficiary deed or a transfer on death deed. Some won't. Uh, But even then, if you don't have the right guidance to look over that deed or those beneficiary designations and make sure things line up from the operation of your documents, the tax principles behind your documents, and even the creditor protection aspects of your documents, then the plan may not operate as intended down the road if and when the worst happens. Right. I mean, two things to pull out. One, the the thought and putting, this is a question we put in front of clients, you're not going to be here everything that's easily in your head that you will never forget, nobody's going to know. And things are worse now, or or they're more complicated because nobody gets paper statements. So because they're not getting paper statements, we're trying to find out where all of this stuff is that belong to you. There's no easy way to go look up, you know, oh, you've got life insurance with Prudential or Northwestern Mutual or whoever it is. So just getting that you know, having them walk through the experiment of what do we need to know to find all of your stuff. The exactly. other thing, right. The other thing I liked was thinking about the beneficiary designations and, you know, it, the will is going to only control what doesn't have that legal label. So we want to make sure that for everything that does have 
those legal labels. We want to apply them and make sure they're pointing in the right direction. Because again, the 401k, the IRA are the easy things to think about. But we want to make sure it's going to the right place because it doesn't matter if the will says leave it all to this person. But if the 401k is going to whoever it was, that's not it doesn't help that the will doesn't say that. Agreed. And it's not just financial assets. Those are the traditional low hanging fruit where, you know, if you're lucky, you can track down statements. There's probably going to be some written evidence like a checkbook or something somewhere that's going to possibly direct your loved ones to that if you haven't created a, a comprehensive list. But more and more, to your point, paper records are missing. Uh, it's rare that you have the file cabinet of statements and tax returns from prior years. A lot of people live their lives online. They do everything online. And really your head knowledge is your connection between fingers and keyboard to know what's your login, what's your password. And sometimes it's something that you can easily guess <laughs> that sometimes that a loved one could crack the code <laughs> if they know it, but it may not be universally applicable. So having a list of logins and passwords is also important. And I'm, I'm one of those skeptics where I hear a lot of practitioners talk about digital assets and often think about, well, yeah, it, it's kind of this uh, shiny thing to, to try to differentiate yourself. But I feel like with, that was 10 years ago. Now we've gotten to the point where, you know, it's really important to kind of wrap your head around this. And I even encourage people before they even see me to come do estate planning that it's not going to mean as much if you haven't done the homework up front. If you have not gone through and said, okay, if say I'm married, could my wife or my husband step in, take charge of all these accounts, log in to keep the utilities going to our house, make sure the mortgage is paid. And all of these are scenarios I've seen in, in real life, make sure the car insurance is up to date because all of these little things are gonna pop up and it's not just the logins and passwords, it's when is it due? <laughs> what's, what's the timeline for it? So you have to build some context around that. But then again, it becomes an issue of how do you keep that info up to date? Because even if you put in the homework up front, passwords change, logins change, you get locked out of things. And if you don't have the discipline to sit down and keep that up to date every month, uh, which few people want to, because then they have to think about death and that's not fun. They have better things to think about. But if you don't have that discipline, then it's not going to fully work as it should, as it's intended. Right. Right. I mean, as I think about passwords, it's something that we've been asking clients for a while and explicitly asking them, how are you storing these passwords? Because if, you know, the, the, the answers are getting better, we're not getting so many, oh, they're all in my head as we used to get, people are slowly moving into at least it's written down somewhere so we know where to go look for things. We've, you know, we've got a map, we know where the, where the things, where the treasure chests are buried, we just don't have the keys. You know, the next step obviously is getting people into, you know, either iChain or Apple's keychain or whatever they're using on Android. But really, I, I like it when clients are using professional password managers because it does allow you to be cross-platform. You know, I've, I've got Apple stuff at home. I've got IBM or PC stuff at the office. I want to be able to use it across. And that is that is a selling point for me to have these outside password managers. And then, you know, sharing passwords with other people comes easier. I mean, the other side of it, Apple is very clear on who can have access to things and you, they're trying to make it easier. They're trying to address this, but it's not perfect. And even just having the phone and logging in, we've talked about this in previous episodes where they'll, you know, the, those companies are going to be within their rights under the, the EULA that you signed when you click the button after, you know, scrolling through it as fast as you can, they can just eliminate all of your contact if they figure out you're, you know, you are not the person logging in. So it's, it's something to think about. Agreed. And that's what a lot of people don't think about is the fact that for so many of these online contacts you have, it's really a creature of contract where you've really entered into a custodial agreement with somebody who runs a server and stores your info. And, you know, if you don't have the 
patience to dig into the 20 page terms of service that changes every couple of weeks and figure out what it says in terms of who can access it or who from your estate can access it, then you could easily run into problems down the road as well. And that's again, one of those where, you know, keeping passwords up to date uh, is difficult in and of itself, but nobody, <laughs> unless they're just gluttons for punishment, can keep track of all those end user license agreements that change every so often and you know you see the headlines like for facebook or meta or whatever where every so often something will pop up about oh look what they snuck into their new terms of service now but it's usually in the privacy context and few people think about okay how do we look at this from the estate planning context of how can we preserve access or create the legacy page or whatever the case might be and i've even seen it on utility accounts too where i've had you know people where loved ones pass and they're trying to call up, you know, internet service provider, or, you know, utility and, you know, they're not on the account. So the call center won't talk to them. And all of a sudden they're, they're thinking, okay, I'm grieving and I've got to keep the lights on too. I've got to have internet access. How do I keep that going? And, you know, even if it's not a matter of sharing an, an account or password, a lot of times you can add on a uh, an additional user or a delegate under a lot of these accounts, you can have that backdoor access just in case it's needed in a pinch. Yeah, and I mean, kind of bringing it back to traditional assets, one of the things that I've gotten back into the habit doing, you know, after doing taxable estate planning for years, the, the recommendation was always, oh, well, no, we need to make sure that we preserve all of the cash accounts for funding trusts and make sure, you know, never use joint tenancy because then you can't fund anything. The assets, have, they're gone. But it really, you know, with, with our high exemptions right now, more people were worried about preserving access to being able to pay bills. You know, don't upset the Apple cart by having a surviving spouse who's already grieving, but now has zero access to cash for the, you know, four to six weeks that we wait till we can get a probate hearing. This is really a, it's become a bigger issue where we're going through and looking at clients and, you know, for a lot of them we're saying, go ahead and let's turn on this joint tenancy because a lot of clients assume that's what it's going to be. And, you know, they, they look at it and say, well, both names are on these accounts. We must be fine. The reality is you've got both names on there and the bank's probably just going to freeze that account when they hear that one of you has died. Exactly. And a lot of people confuse joint tenancy with just joint titling. If you don't have that joint tenancy with a right of survivorship label on there, or if you are in a state that recognizes tenancy by the entirety between spouses, if you don't have it reflected as, say, as spousal ownership or husband and wife, whatever the case might be, then yeah, that, that's another huge risk you run. Even if you have your one half deemed ownership of the account, are you even going to be able to access that? And uh, one practice I see in the business world that I wish would trickle down a little bit more to individuals is the idea of petty cash. So a lot of businesses will have the petty cash bin hidden in a safe or something like that. And I like that, that idea to your point, John, of if you need access to cash, have that petty cash available, carve that off so that family members who need it quickly in a pinch can access it. Not, not even if you're dead, but if you're hospitalized or something like that and the need arises. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, this sort of thing that you keep, you know, my mom, Many times growing up, you know, here's 20 or $100 bill. You're never allowed to spend it except in emergencies. And, you know, I'd usually find an emergency here or there, and so it'd disappear. But the sort of thing of if you always have that cash, it generally still does work. And there have been, there have been times where it wasn't necessarily an emergency, but I was buying a coffee somewhere that, you know, the registers went down, and they, they had these lines, and they're like, well, we can't do anything. I was able to just take the twenty dollar bill out, put it on the counter, and say, "I'm like, I'm leaving now. The rest is yours." Mm -hmm. And people don't have, you know, it, it's really kind of taking things back and making sure that you're set for emergencies that you didn't even create, or even if it's not life threatening, just making it easy. And that's, well, you know, the petty cash idea, not just the twenty dollars in the car, the the fives and ones, always there. Now that we're mostly cashless. But having the, you know, the strong box in the house with copies of everything, having some cash. So if you do need to run or, if, you know, if, if the hurricane's coming because we're here in Texas, you can grab that and you've got all the important documents in one place. 
Agreed. Yeah. goes back to the Ferrari analogy. Once you've built it, you got to have money to fill up the gas tank and pay tolls. Exactly. Yep. Well, Griffin, uh, you know, as we're kind of looking here at closing down this interview, what's one thing that our listeners who are advising clients but may not be attorneys themselves, what's one thing they should be thinking about as they help their clients with their estate plans and their, their own planning? What's something that those CPAs and financial advisors can help with? I think the the big picture is that an attorney often only sees a sliver of the client's picture and estate planning needs and really is engaged on, for, for better or for worse, a transactional basis to put documents in place. And the attorney can only draft around what they know. So when it comes to these opening and closing items, um, yeah, the client can try to ask the attorney about them, but they don't. The attorney is going to want to bill by the hour to answer those types of questions, and uh, it, it, you're going to end up running into, you know, something that is hard to get a client to act on to begin with after they've been through the ringer with an estate plan, uh, and they're definitely not going to act on it if there's more money involved to get the correct answers. So the more of that light lifting you can do, the better your client's going to be in terms of who has not just the client's head knowledge and how do we get it onto paper, but as an advisor, what's your own head knowledge of the client's specific needs and what's out there that needs to be thought of and integrated into the estate plan itself. And it goes not just to what's outside of the documents, but what's in them as well. Um, You know, it's easy as an attorney or an advisor to sit there and think, okay, well, I know exactly what went into these documents. I know them backwards and forwards. I know why we did this. The client may remember that for a time, but they're not doing this day to day. They're not interacting with it. So down the road, they're going to have a question. Why did we set up this trust this way? Why did we pick two fiduciaries instead of one? What was the point of even doing this to begin with? So the more you can have access to that information and either be able to answer it yourself or be able to connect with the right subject matter expert, being an attorney or strategist or somebody else, then the better off the client's going to be to to handle that day to day of at least knowing what they've signed after the ink dries. Excellent. Griffin, where can people follow up with you if they've got questions for you or just want to get in touch? So the best way to connect with me is by email. You can reach me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, My law firm website is hutchinslaw.com, so you can reach me on there. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. Just search Griffin Bridgers. uh, So I provide a lot of educational content on there and sometimes interviews where I switch seats (laughs) from where John is right now as well. And I've got a website in the works. It'll be griffinbridgers.com, but uh, it is being developed. So if you're listening to this beyond November of 2022, it might be live, but before then it probably won't be. Um, But those are the best places to find me. Great. Griffin, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John, and appreciate it.